I'm responsible basically for trying to take data and AI applications into actual practical use on uh, real life patients in order to try to treat them better, uh, more proactively, more in a more personalized manner. manner. And um, I'll try to share some of the experience of what uh, we see in, in, in practice when we try to treat patients based on, based on data and models. And I'll try to share with you the fairness aspects uh, of trying to utilize this data in order to do uh, basically good. So as a <clears throat> general outline uh, for the next couple of hours, and we have uh, a break in the middle, so we'll see where that fits uh, as we uh, go along. We'll start by a brief introduction of the healthcare system in Israel and specifically uh, Klalit, which is the healthcare organization that I work for, uh, basically in order to understand the kinds of, of setting and the kind of data that we use in, in the projects that I will present today. Then we will discuss fairness uh, considerations uh, in the development and application of prediction models uh, that are meant to be applied in practice for actual patient uh, care. And we'll end up by talking a bit about how causality can be used to increase fairness towards subgroups uh, and how uh, a lot of the current medical information that we have from RCTs, which are randomized clinical trials, are not very relevant for specific subgroups in the population. And that makes it uh, unfair because those subgroups cannot make uh, informed medical decision, decisions based on results from those RCPs. So we'll talk about how we can use causality uh, in order to study subgroup effects for these uh, subgroups and increase the fairness towards them and allow them to make uh, personalized, personalized decisions and empower, basically to empower them to, to make their own decisions uh, regarding treatments that they can choose to, to get, um, et cetera. So we'll start a bit about uh, the healthcare system in Israel and I'll, it will be really uh, better if this is an open discussion. And if you have questions, uh, then you will stop me and at any point. Uh, and I don't know how that will work if I'm not physically there, but if you, I think that if you'll raise your hand, uh, I'll be able to see you, even though it's like a really small rectangle. Uh, I hope that I'll be able to notice it. And if, if I won't, just, just say something and, uh, it'll be really, really, uh, more fun if we can make it into a discussion, uh, even though I'm not physically there. So a bit about the medical system in Israel. So basically, uh, in the past 20 something years, we have mandatory health insurance in Israel. That means that we have a predefined uh, service basket. That, that's a list of services that each uh, Israel citizen should be um, allowed to get in terms of health care. And the payment and eligibility in order to get this, uh, very, it's a bit pretty generous uh, service basket. Uh, it are not tied to one another. So basically, it's a very fair system, uh, which allows a very good level of health care to all Israeli citizens, regardless of the amount of money that they pay from their salary each month in order to support that medical uh, system. Uh, and these services are basically provided by four payer provider health care organiza organizations. That means that, that those are organizations are not exactly like the, um, let's say, HMOs uh, in the US because they're not just the payers, uh, they are also, or the insurers, they are also the provider of the services. And that that is very important because that means that we have a lot of data uh, in one place, in one system, regarding both the all the transactions that happen that, like as an insurer, but we also have all the very detailed clinical data about patients, which allows us to uh, take a lot of, of this data and translate it into models and to actual um, predictions that can target the treatment to the correct patients. Uh, so that kind of a system in which the HMO is both the payer and the provider of services 
uh, basically allows us to have very good individual level data regarding all aspects of care. Um, individuals in Israel can change freely between these four health, uh, health of six, six funds. They used to be called six, six funds. Now they're actually called health funds. Uh, they can move freely between them, but they actually pretty rarely do so because only one to two percent of the population uh, changes HMOs each year. That means that we have pretty good longitudinal data about our patients. Uh, specifically, Clarit Health Services uh, is the largest of these four healthcare organizations. Uh, we insure over half of the Israeli population. So we currently have something around 4.8 million uh, insured individuals. Uh, and we have a pretty good data warehouse, which is centralized because, uh, and I did not say that before, uh, these health funds were not just initiated around 20 something years ago. They were also computerized basically when they uh, were initiated. So starting from around 1995, uh, all of the system has been digitalized and data is accumulating since then, giving us very good retrospective historical data with pretty good uh, longitudinal follow-up about basically everything that we want to study. Uh, and a lot of the talk uh, today will be centered around projects and uh, models and research studies that have been conducted in an in-house research institute uh, within the Clelit Innovation Division um, that serves within that healthcare organization. Uh, and the fact that we have an in-house research institute allows us to, to be pretty agile and develop solutions pretty quickly, but it also means that we have the accountability to make sure that the, these solutions are um, fair and that they uh, behave as we expect them to behave uh, and that they provide a promise that we think that they provide. Uh, and uh, my connection to the type of, of lectures that you had this week is from that perspective of trying to make sure that the applicative side of things that go into uh, practical uh, medical care uh, will actually take all of the theoretical concepts of fairness and make sure that we adhere to them. Uh, and that is how uh, I know uh, Guy and, and Cynthia, and we collaborate basically in order to create, um, or translate these theoretical concepts into something that is uh, actually very down to earth and affects patients' lives. So let's start by talking about prediction models. I think we'll spend the the hour, um, the full hour about prediction models and then probably the next hour about causality analysis and how that translates into fairness. So before we dive into fairness aspect of prediction models, I want to talk a bit about why we use prediction models in medicine and why are these prediction models so useful for us when we try to take care of patients uh, in a better way. And the power of AI models in medicine, it's basically to do this, to shed a spotlight, a specific spotlight on a subgroup of patients that are specifically at a high risk for some future or current condition that was not diagnosed. And the reason that this is so important is because all healthcare systems around the world are um, basically overwhelmed uh, with the amount of um, patients and the amount of, of chronic conditions that they need to handle. And the prospect of utilizing um, basically preventive care, uh, which is the, be the best kind of medicine that we can do because it's the most effective kind of medicine that we can uh, apply, is something that is very hard to do when you have uh, basically, uh, it's some, some people call it uh, tyranny of the acute. You're trying to keep your, basically to keep your head uh, above water and to treat whatever comes, you do not have the time to think about all the potential future conditions that someone might suffer from in 10 years or five years or one year and try to prevent all of them at once. Uh, that's just something that is not practical. But if we could shed that spotlight on a group of patients that actually need us the most for a specific condition that they might suffer from, then we can aim our preventive efforts 
uh, towards that um, condition specifically for those individuals. And if that beam, that spotlight is is narrower and includes the vast majority of, of people that are here, colored here in red, marking that they, they have the highest risk, or they're actually people who will deteriorate or experience the negative outcome that we're trying to prevent, then the, the model will be more effective and there's better chance that our physicians I will have the time to actually act upon the recommendations that we give them and, and, and utilize that uh, 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 basically preventive care. So the, the one uh, example that I will give you, the one practical example that I will give you before we dive into the, the aspects of, of fairness uh, is a condition called hepatitis C. So hepatitis C is a is a virus like like COVID nineteen, but our SARS sorry SARS CoV two uh, COVID nineteen is the disease it's not the virus, uh, and hepatitis C is basically as opposed to SARS CoV two, that's a virus that if you catch it and it's usually uh, you can catch it by uh, when blood uh, from an infected individual somehow touches the blood of an uninfected, uninfected individual, um, then what happens is that in about 50% of the cases, the acute infection does not go away. So the individual become a chronic carrier of the virus, and uh, that virus resides in the liver, and then gradually uh, damages the cells of the liver. And it is said, or it is claimed that the, the number one cause of liver cancer and transplants in um, Western countries today is hepatitis C. And until a few years ago, until around 2013, 2014, there wasn't very effective treatment in order to, to handle that virus. Uh, the treatment was given in shots. It had horrible side effects, some compared it to chemotherapy. And it only was only effective in around about 50% of the cases. So if you were able to tolerate the, the pretty horrible treatment, only 50% of the patients uh, got cured from the virus. And a few years ago, it was a miracle, basically. And uh, new kinds of treatments uh, came into market, which are not given uh, through injections, but uh, rather given per os, like it was in pills. So they're easier to take. They had almost no side effects. You take them for 8 to 12 weeks, weeks usually, uh, depends on the strain. And then... In more than 98% of the cases, you're cured. So that was really amazing. And that brought the, the concept of maybe this, this disease could be eliminated. And the WHO, the World Health Organization, basically came up with a plan to, co to combat hepatitis C and B, that's a different kind of virus that we will not discuss, uh, by uh, the year 2030. They want to reach an elimination of these viruses by 2030. Uh, hepatitis C through these treatments that I've just discussed, and hepatitis B through vaccinations. That's a different story. Uh, but the problem with hepatitis C is that it is estimated that around 50% of those who are infected are actually undiagnosed. So no one knows, not them or the medical system, that they have that virus. And that means no one can treat them and give them those like almost magic pills that will cure them. So all we need to do is basically to screen individuals, to identify those silent carriers, and make sure that we treat them uh, correctly. So the WHO uh, basically approached every uh, member country uh, in the World Health Organization and asked that they come up with a plan to screen individuals for hepatitis C. And the way that the Israeli um, Ministry of Health approached that situation is to basically uh, go to the leading hepatologist in Israel, uh, those doctors that treat liver conditions, and ask them who they think we should screen, who are the most high-risk patients that we should screen uh, in order to identify those silent carriers and treat them. So basically, they, come, they came, came up with a list of, of a few rules of which patients should be screened. Those rules were basically uh, former residents of HCV endemic countries. That means countries in which um, the population has high percentages or high prevalence of HCV. People who received blood products before 1992 when uh, that virus were, was uh, basically uh, discovered and 
we started to test blood products and identify the virus within them. And IV uh, intravenous drug users, because as we said, one of the ways that this virus uh, uh, transfers is uh, through blood and infected needles is, is a major route of, of infection. So basically, if we think about it in a, and that's the first uh, uh, computer part of this, of this talk, uh, if we think about it as an algorithm, this is a very simple decision tree, right? Either you're A, B, or C. If the answer is yes, then you are screened. If the answer is no, then you're not being screened. Uh, and that's, that's not very sophisticated. Uh, that's a pretty uh, simplistic way of, of looking up, uh, on decisions in medicine. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, and maybe I should have said it uh, at the beginning, so I'm a medical doctor. My specialty is in public health. I also have a PhD in computer science. So I basically, I live between the worlds of, of medicine and computer science. And I'll tell you that in medicine, many, many decisions are made in this level of, of simplicity or lack of complexity. Uh, and we think that we can do better by using models exactly for the, for the purpose that I've discussed to, to create that spotlight that will be um, uh, targeted specifically for those individuals who are at a very high risk for uh, hepatitis C. So you can imagine that the way that we do it is to go back in, in time in retrospective data and collect data re about individuals that for some reason were tested for hepatitis C. So in this case, we had more than 300,000 of these. Then we see that about 1.5% uh, not 1.5%, 0.5% of these individuals are actually uh, found to be active carriers of the disease that, that should be treated. And then we can train a model that processes a lot of clinical variables. Usually we have like we have an automail infrastructure that automatically processes like 20,000 in, 20, individual um, variables from the medical record with the outcome of interest, creating a model that should pick up the patterns of which patients are at a specific high risk. And the first model that we have is a very white box algorithm. Uh, and that is um, not by chance, because when you try to convince a very uh, conservative um, profession like medicine to try to act upon an AI model, as opposed to the expert of the, uh, the, the advice of the, the expert, that's something that you, you need to do a very hard work in, of con convincing. Uh, but if you zoom in into that uh, decision tree, which is still a decision tree, but, but it's much more complicated uh, and much more detailed than this very simplistic one suggested by the expert, then you still see that the very first splits are the variables or the risk factors that were picked up by the experts. But then you see many, many other variables that come up or jump from the data and suggest that we can identify the patients uh, in a more efficient manner. And after we gain their trust and the, the basically the policymakers within the health organization, health organization to convince them that this is a very effective way of screening individuals, then uh, we try to ask them to do another leap of faith and to trust us when we say it's not a single decision tree that you can see, it's something more complicated, say an XGBoost model in this case, which has many, 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 many trees that run simultaneously and, and give you uh, the, the final verdict of, verdict of the uh, individual risk level of that patient. So in this case, it's actually very effective. Uh, if we say that we have 0.5% of silent carriers within the population, and then we say that, for example, our algorithm in one of the suggested cutoff Cutoffs uh, marks 6.6% of, uh, of the population as a high risk and candidates for screening. Then if we randomly uh, screen all of these 6.6%, then we expect to identify 6.6% of those uh, marked in red, those positive individuals or the silent carriers of the virus. But actually in practice, what happens is that uh, the, the lift is pretty good. And instead of like we're screening only 6% of the population, but instead of identifying only these random 6% uh, of the carriers, we actually identify 72% of the cases. 
Uh, you call it uh, recall. We call it in medicine sensitivity. It means the same thing. But basically, it's a very good way to do a very targeted screening. Uh, and actually, that's the way we currently do screening for hepatitis C in CLELIT, in the health organization that I work for, and to identify the patients that are really at high risk and to, to try to make our screening efforts much more focused on the correct patients. So uh, we look at it uh, as an evolution of decision complexity. You, you're probably pretty surprised from the left side of this of this slide of the how how not complex the decisions are, but you need to understand that in medicine this this evolution uh, is something that is just starting to happen, and most medical decisions are still in the upper left side of of this slide. But we're trying to to advance that evolution, and now that we've seen one example of how we use prediction models in medicine, then we should ask ourselves, should we care about model fairness in medicine? Okay, I created a model. It's very effective. I've shown you the, the performance. Um, I can also tell you that in, in like smaller portions of, the, of this prediction model, if I only screen like 1% of the population, I get to a lift of about 40. So it's really a really good model. It really identified uh, the correct patients for screening. So I have a good, pretty good model. I have pretty good performance. Do, do I need to care about fairness? And the reason that we are in the medical system so intrigued by algorithm fairness and by the, all of the things that you've discussed this week is that the reason is that healthcare is basically uh, a field that is constant, constantly scrutinized for different aspects of disparities. And I, I, the, the, there's the one piece of Hebrew in this slide, but I, I just, I wanted to put it here because that's the beginning of the, of the uh, uh, national insurance, uh, health insurance law in Israel. And the reason I put it here, and you know, maybe, maybe only Guy can uh, testify that, that I'm not lying, but uh, the reason is that to, to say that this very long, um, Law basically starts with the words, the health insurance under this law will be based on principles of justice, equality, and mutual responsibility. Uh, and that means that the first thing that uh, the people who wrote this law and had the vision to create this healthcare system thought about is fairness. And, and that's the reason that we care so deeply about fairness when we talk about uh, applying prediction models in practice, uh, because when we embrace these models, and, and I try to show you that we're trying to um, to bring those models into more and more aspects of care, then we can't um, exclude ourselves from the need or the, the liability or any, any other word that you will choose to act upon um, these models in a fair way and to make sure that we're not creating any unfairness in the process. So when we try to map where that unfairness can pop up when we utilize and develop and, and then utilize prediction models in medicine, we think you, we usually think about three different uh, phases of the process. Uh, it's just easier for us. It's not, it's not like the correct uh, uh, the way to, to think about it. It's just the way that I think about it and it's easier for me to convey that. So uh, that's the way we'll talk about it today. The first part of it is the data part of it. And the second part is the modeling. And the third part is when we actually try to take the model results and to utilize them into medical care. So let's start to talk about the data, the historical data that we're using to, to develop the models. And I'll start by uh, an, an example, which is not from the medical domain, but I think it, it helps to, to convey the message. Uh, so a few years ago, uh, there, are, there was a lot of, of, of noise about Amazon um, that created a sexist AI tool, basically a tool that, that helped screen uh, job applications. And the thing about this tool is that uh, for engineering positions, it usually uh, selected male applications and, and did not promote the female applications to the next uh, non-automatic phase of the process. 
And, and the reason that the model uh, did that is not because the model is unfair or not because the model is sexist. Uh, the only reason that it happened is obviously because in the historical data that was used to train these models, um, most of the engineering positions were occupied by males and not by females. Um, I, I work, uh, so my, my academic position uh, is in the faculty of, of engineering uh, in Ben Gurion University. And I can tell you that in my floor, um, I think maybe I'm one of two uh, women still today that, that, um, that uh, like use the, the, the female side of the restroom because those, those issues are still present. And when we try to uh, train models, then that's what we have. And when we think about medicine and how we need to apply these kinds of, of worries to medicine, then we can think about different ways that data sets can uh, promote or uh, not promote, just document historical uh, unfairness. So for example, we can think about differential misclassification. Uh, a classic example in medicine is that uh, MIs, MIs are myocardial infarctions, heart attacks. Heart attacks. Um, they usually happen in a very, they, they have a, a very specific set of, of symptoms, which I'm sure that will, if I will ask you what are the hallmarks of, of a heart attack or what are the hallmark symptoms, then you'll be able to tell me what those symptoms are. The thing is that the symptoms that you will uh, list are symptoms that are classical for men. They're not classic for women, which present in an entirely different way. That means that in the historical data, we may have many more men, males that are tagged as had like having a heart, a heart attack in the past, as opposed to women that maybe had the same condition, but were never diagnosed because they had very non-classic symptoms. So that means that when we try to train a model and identify individuals at, um, or quantify the risk of heart attacks in individuals, maybe this model will be much more accurate for men and much less accurate for women because that's just the data that we have in the system. A different kind of, of historical unfairness that we can have in the data is uh, differential missing data. So that means that Specific people have missing values, not because it's random. So it's not missing completely at random. It's actually because maybe they did not use the medical system. So they did not, they had less money uh, or they did, they lived in places where they, where they have less access to medical services. So they just didn't visit their doc doctor and that doctor did not send them to, uh, to do lab work. And that means that when we train a model that uses a lot, uses a lot of uh, variables from the lab data, for example, maybe some of these individuals will be misclassified or misrepresented um, in, in the correct place in the feature space. And that's a problem. And I'll ask you, anyone in the audience, whether you think of a way that we can maybe try to handle this unfairness and to correct for it. So they promise that if you will speak, I will hear you, even though you don't have microphones. So anyone has any idea of how to handle this uh, unjust fairness in the data? <laughs> okay, yeah. so I don't see anyone um, raising their finger. So I, I, I'll say that I don't have any answer either. So this is the one part of the process, uh, which uh, I don't think we have a good answer for, but I encourage all of you to think about it because maybe uh, in your research, in your work, you'll come up with something that will help us to, to overcome this. But currently it's a problem that we need to be aware of. Uh, we need to consider but we don't really have a lot of things to, to, to correct for this data. We can try to, to create better uh, diagnosis schemas. We, we, try, we can try to make the data better, but that's the future process 
uh, it, it's not something that we can uh, do in order to um, make, affect the past unless we we have a very good way of, of thinking about what the proportion of misdiagnosis and to maybe think about which variables are, are connected to this misdiagnosis. But basically it's, it's, it's guesswork and it's not accurate and it's something that we can't really do accurately. So we try to make sure that we are aware of it, but we can't really do a lot about it. The second part of the process uh, is the modeling process. Um, and so I'm, I'm not the person to teach you these kinds of things. Uh, you have uh, experts teaching you these kinds of things this week. I'll just pre I present several concepts just that you understand that these are the concepts that I'm talking about and you can connect them to the uh, theoretical lectures that you've heard uh, in, in the past few days, and then I'll connect them to medicine and to application. So basically, when we're doing uh, the modeling process, the prediction models try to optimize some function uh, on the training set, and the performance measures that they usually consider are average on the entire training set. That means the populations that are underrepresented in the training set may receive non-accurate predictions. Uh, and that means that maybe we create something unfair towards these uh, subgroups. But the question is, what is non-accurate? And you can define accuracy in prediction models in various ways. In medicine, usually we discuss discrimination and calibration. So discrimination here is, is the good sense of discrimination, uh, the, the, the ability of the model to sort the individuals from the highest risk patient to the lowest risk patient. Uh, and specific cutoffs of, of this um, uh, continuum of, of risk could be used in order to define uh, who is at high risk and, and low risk. And then we can calculate based on these cutoffs, different measures such as recall or sensitivity, the amount of uh, individuals who are at high risk through high risk or actually uh, go to go on to develop that condition that we're interested in. So how many of these will be identified, or what proportion of these will be identified uh, based on the cutoff that we chose? Uh, we can talk about specificity, which I'll not go into. We could talk about positive predictive value or precision in, in again, different terms uh, because it's different domains, but same meaning. So the amount of or the proportion of patients that we will uh, mark as high risk that will actually go on to deteriorate. So what, the, what proportion of these uh, were actually um, true positives? And we can talk about calibration. Uh, and calibration is uh, the correlation between what we, uh, the, the absolute risk that we uh, predict and the actually observed risk that we see. And we'll get to it in a second. And again, protected features is something that I'm sure you, you've discussed, but in medicine, the protected features that we usually talk about are ethnicity, sex, age, socioeconomic status, and immigration. Uh, I told you that medicine is all about disparities uh, and talking about disparities. So usually when we talk about disparities, we talk about them with respect to these subpopulations. And as I'm sure you've already heard, uh, we cannot think about these subpopulations separately. We also need to think about uh, the different con um, combinations of, of specific characteristics together, creating many, many subgroups that we should uh, think about and consider. So um, something that you may may talked about uh, this week and something that sometimes uh, people discuss uh, when they talk, talk about algorithm fairness uh, is equalizing acceptance rate, acceptance, acceptance rate, um, aka acceptance. And I think it makes a lot of sense in some domains. The reason that I'm, I'm putting this here in this presentation about practical applications of algorithmic fairness in medicine is that uh, I'm trying to convince you that I think it may be less relevant for some very classic variables in medicine, but it may be indeed relevant for others. So um, acceptance or equalizing acceptance rate 
basically means that we want uh, the same uh, average prediction uh, for different subpopulations. And that means that we want to make sure that the predictions uh, are not affected with regard to some variable. And that means that we think that the prediction is actually not affected by that variable or should morally not be affected by that uh, variable or the outcome should not morally be affected by that variable even in, if in practice currently maybe in the historical data it, it does and um, the, the generic positions in the example from amazon i think is a good example of what, what when we think about gender so in the historical data it was uh, it had very high correlation between gender and the and the proportion or, or the probability that someone will be hired for an engineering position. But morally, we think that that variable should not really affect the model. And that's, that's the reason we need to make sure that maybe the model in some way does not consider that variable. Um, we'll skip the formalization because I'm sure you know it. But the big question for us today is, is acceptance relevant for the medical domain? And as, as we said, it sounds reasonable in some domains. But if we think about sex, for example, it seems like something that is completely not relevant for medicine, right? Because almost any medical condition is affected by sex. Uh, different proportions of disease are found within females and males. So that means that that's something that we need to, to consider when we create a prediction model. If we create a prediction model, say for osteoporotic fractures, and we ignore the sex variable, that will be ridiculous because 90 something percent of the cases are females. And that's just biology. It's not unfairness. It is maybe bio biological unfairness towards women, but that's just fact. So um, we can't use it. So when we think about sex, it's not reasonable. But there are variables that we can think about in medicine that should not affect the outcome. And we are pretty sure that biology has nothing to do with them. So for example, if you think about socioeconomic status, that is something that we think should not affect biologically uh, in a biological manner, the outcome or the medical outcome, but sadly uh, in many condition, uh, conditions it still does. And another variable, Sure. So Please. going back to an example uh, Cynthia gave in one of her lectures of uh, air pollution. So you know, it could be the case that in areas that are you know, low, have poor or lower socioeconomic status, there is more air pollution and all of the diseases that come with it. So you certainly wouldn't accept, you know, in an ideal world, we would want uh, the diseases that come from pollution to be. I'm sorry, I have an intruder. Guy, you're going to go to the lab. You're going to go to I'm sorry. Uh, uh, that's evening time in Israel. That means kids are in the house and one of them escaped uh, the father's watch. Um, so that's a very good question. Uh, and it, it's like... Um, I'll give this example and then I think we can have a better discussion about it. And, and, and the, the one variable that is currently really uh, debated in exactly that manner, uh, be because it could affect the outcome, but it should not affect the outcome, is race, for example. So when I was uh, in med school, I think that, I don't wanna say all, but many, many, many prediction models in medicine not the XGBoost models, but the very simplistic models that we use in many clinical domains or different simple calculators of risk, take uh, race into account. It's just one of the variables that you put into the model. And in recent years, there is a big debate of whether the introduction of that variable into all of these prediction models was a mistake or was it justified? And uh, the, the leading clinical journals, and, and the one that you see here is the New England Journal of Medicine. So I don't know if you, like, for medical doctors, just seeing that red font on, on that yellowish 
um, background, uh, it triggers like uh, that's like that's the Bible for us. Uh, and and the main or leading medical journals in recent years uh, publish a lot of, of of pieces about the use of race in prediction models. And the reason it was used before in, medi in, in, in prediction models is that it was thought that race reflects some sort of, of genetic predisposition or genetic differences. But in practice, maybe it is much more reflective of race-based inequalities or socioeconomic status or guy with respect to what you ask where you live and, and how uh, and the air quality that you breathe. So which one is it? Because, and, and I will also claim that it, it kind of depends on what you want to do with the, uh, with the prediction. If, if you think that your prediction will be used, and, and may, in many cases it actually does, not in Israel, but, but in other places in the world, it's used in order to decide who is eligible to, to be included in some insurance plan or the insurance premium that you will get then we think that it's unfair that someone that lives in, in a place with poor air conditions uh, and, and, and pollution and maybe has low access to, to healthy food and whatever, and for all sorts of reasons have higher risk of certain medical conditions, that they should not be uh, eligible to receive that healthcare plan, or they should pay higher premiums uh, to be included in some insurance. So obviously, I think, I think, not if you agree, that that's not fair. If, on the contrary, you want to create this, uh, to use these predictions in order to recruit individuals for some extra care that they will receive free of charge that will um, make sure that they have uh, the, the higher uh, risk individuals are taken care, care of and that we reduce their risk, then I think that it's something that we really want to consider because if, if they're truly at a higher risk because they poor they live in those uh, places where, with uh, poor air quality, then we want to make sure that we pick the right individuals that are actually at the highest risk. So it actually, that's the third part of the, of the potential unfairness, that's the how you use the model. So for me, when I'm trying to make these decisions, and that, that's something we do on a daily basis, whether we use these kinds of variables in the models or not, I'm trying to think about the kind of way that we'll use the model and whether we, create, we are advancing fairness in the world or are we uh, creating some sort of unfairness. But uh, yeah. There was a recent um, uh, article in JAMA about race-free estimation of kidney function. Um, now, it, this does not fall into, as far as I understood what you were saying, this doesn't really fall into either of the categories that you're talking about in your decision making. Because here the question is, in some sense, is race a coherent thing biologically and Many people argue it's not. And then what's it doing in the formula and you know, for estimating lamellar filtration rate? So this seems to not quite live in the categories that you've just described. So can you help make a question out of that and then answer it? Yeah, and I think that's an excellent question because that's my next slide. That's, that's the paper that you're discussing, right? Um, so. Okay, so maybe it's a different one. It's also, that's from JAMA, uh, but it's discussing exactly what you just described, the inclusion of race in the estimation of GFR, glomerular filtration rate. And so, so I, I didn't see that, I need to read that, but that, that's, that's something from two years ago. And that's something uh, um, uh, that's, Created uh, big waves of, of of and discussions and and um, because so I'll try to I, I'll just 
uh, fill everyone in to, to what this article says, and then I'll try to ask the question and to answer it. So basically, this article claims that, and again, when I said that when I was taught medicine, there was like, when I took my exams, if I forgot to say that uh, one of the main variables in the uh, formula of how you calculate the GFR, which is uh, the estimation of how well your kidneys basically work, then I forgot one of, of very few very important variables, and that's like completely not okay. Uh, because one of the main, uh, main variables in the formula of creating uh, creatinine, which is one of the um, lab results that you have in your lab work, that's the pretty standardized lab test, and you try to take that and translate that into how well your kidney works, then one of the uh, uh, variables were whether or not you're African-American or not. So whether or not you're African-American. So, and the question was, and, and the reasoning was, was the same as in the previous slide. It was thought that uh, uh, African-Americans have higher, I, I'm, not, I'm not expert, and I'm not a nephrologist, and I'm not an expert specifically in this field, but it was basically thought that uh, they have uh, more um, uh, muscle mass, and that's why they have certain levels of creatinine, and that's why that uh, factor should go into the formula. And for that reason, it was actually thought that biologically, the way to translate the creatinine level into the uh, GFR, which is the, the, the kidney performance level, is actually more accurate if you take that factor in. So I think, Cynthia, your question is, it's not in, like in the, in the example of the air pollution, because we, we know that air pollution is a risk factor for many, many conditions. And maybe we need to take that into effect because it's accurate. It's biologically a risk factor. And if we take that into account, then we need to consider whether or not it's fair more in the production phase of the model. Because if we take that into account, because it's accurate and it's biologically accurate that people who live in, in places with poor um, uh, air quality, then we are creating unfairness or not because we're going to um, offer them extra services or to deny them some services. But in this case, the difference is that the claim today is that it's just not biologically accurate. Not that it's not fair uh, to include that variable in the model or not. It's just that it's not accurate. We thought that there is a biological difference between African-Americans and say Caucasians. And that difference should means that we translate the uh, creatinine level in a different way to a GFR level, but currently the claim in these in these uh, papers is that that's just not the case. It was all a mistake. Uh, it was some I, I don't even know what to, to trace back why that mistake was was started, but it was just a mistake, and those variables uh, should not be in the model because it's just not accurate. It's not fair or unfair. It's just not accurate. But the fact that we include them in the model, if it's not accurate biologically and it's not really different, uh, or the GFR should not be uh, assessed differently, then the translation of the inclusion of these variables into the formulas has tremendous effect of unfairness. Uh, because again, to the non-medical uh, audience, the estimation of GFR says very dramatic things. It says, for example, if you're eligible uh, to be a kidney donor or not. And in the other extreme, it says whether or not you should start uh, renal replacement therapy like dialysis or not. So if you're not accurately measuring something, and because historically you thought you should use race in the model, but you shouldn't, then the, the implications have tremendous uh, uh, effect on fairness. Uh, but that's different from the question that Guy asked, because in that case, the inclusion of, of the variable in the model, that's true cor correlation. We will do a better biological prediction. The question is, is it fair to include that variable in the model? I hope I answered the question. I think you're nodding, but the, the picture is so small that maybe I'm imagining it. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, 
So possible solutions when we're sure that there is a variable that uh, it's not fair to, to try to equalize. Uh, uh, or, so sorry, but we think there is a, a variable that, that should not affect the model. But again, for some reason, uh, in the historical data, it does. So uh, what we usually can do is try to avoid using that feature in the model. But models are smart, and if we have enough data, that what will happen is that we they will pick up on it, and they will usually just learn that um, that feature from different features. So if I would not, if I, for example, I think that um, socioeconomic status is something that should not affect uh, prediction of whatever condition, whichever condition, then I can just drop socioeconomic status from the model. But usually the model will pick up on the variable from many, many, many different variables. For example, how many times uh, I go to the um, emergency room, how many times I go to see my GP, uh, which medications I buy, or uh, at what place in Israel, for example, I live in. So we can drop the picture from the model, but maybe it's not enough. And when we're pretty sure that we're creating a model when that should be completely detached from some sort of variable such as socioeconomic status, uh, because we know that it has no biological tendencies, then we can take the extra step of trying to make sure that they're uh, to enforce, enforce the independence between the model outputs and those protected features that we want to make sure the model uh, uh, is not correlated with. And I can tell you that it doesn't happen in many cases that we do this, but uh, I'm currently working on a model. Our team is currently working on a model in which I'm sure that the, at the end of the process, uh, we'll have to make sure that that model specifically uh, is unrelated to socioeconomic status. Because historically in the data, I'm sure that the, the uh, the tagging of the data was related to that. Um, so that was about acceptance. Now we'll talk a bit about calibration. And when we think about calibration, the first thing uh, we need to do is to define it. So again, I'm, I'm, that's not my job <laughs> in the summer school, but um, just to make sure that we're on the, on the same page when we're talking about calibration, basically we want to make sure that when we uh, look at a specific subgroup of individuals that received a probability of P, uh, then the average or the uh, expectance or the, the probability that they will actually have the outcome is equal to P. And if we want to talk about uh, calibration with respect or make sure that the model is calibrated with respect to specific subpopulations, that we want to make sure that applies uh, within subpopulations as well. Uh, the way we usually, when we develop models, when we look about on, uh, uh, on calibration performance, what we usually do is to plot the calibration. That means we're plotting the predicted risk uh, versus the observed risk. Uh, and we want to make sure that it's on the diagonal, whether we're doing it in decils of, of, of uh, uh, risk groups or whether we're doing some smoothing on the, of, of, the, of the plot. Whatever it is, we want it to be on the diagonal that, that, because that means that the predicted risk is basically basically equal to the observed risk. And sometimes we use measures such as calibration in the large uh, when we're trying to basically uh, create some uh, um, numerical variable that will uh, tell us whether our model is calibrated or not. And if the model is calibrated, that variable uh, will be equal to one and it will be um, higher or lower if the model is uh, not calibrated. So again, we're talking about medicine and about the applicative side of all of these things. So do we care about calibration in medicine? Uh, and specifically, obviously, uh, model calibration. And the answer is a definite yes. And the reason that I'm saying that it's a definite yes is because in medicine, many of our decision making is based on absolute risk. That means that the guidelines for physicians state that if the risk is above a certain cutoff, then say, uh, we start uh, a specific medication, and otherwise we do not start that medication. So if we estimate a wrong risk because the model is not calibrated, the whole distribution is, sh is shifted for some reason, then we will not choose the correct uh, path for that individual, and that individual will not get the correct medicine. So we really care about calibration in medicine. And the first medical domain in which 
and still it's, it's the first, but it, it's also the, the, the medical domain in which we still have uh, the, the largest number of, of prediction models is cardiovascular diseases. That means heart attacks, um, CVAs, strokes, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and the first prediction models in medicine were actually developed on uh, a cohort of Caucasian males that were, was actively collected uh, in Framingham. And those models were scrutinized for many, many years for the fact that they are miscalibrated for other groups in the population, such as non-Caucasian and females. And the usual solution back then was to basically re actively recruit a different cohort that we will use in order to uh, create better or fairer prediction models. And one very um, famous, uh, well-known study that did that is called the MESA study. And MESA uh, is short for multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis, that, that's the, the plaques that causes this condition in, in arteries. And basically what they did is to actively assemble a cohort in which we, they did oversampling of different subgroups in the population. Uh, and, and the MESA equations uh, were used for many years and uh, they were considered more fair than the Framingham variable uh, equations. Later on, uh, the more recent uh, versions of Framingham, which is, is relevant until these days, uh, are they, they took care of the problem, but but in the first days, that was the solution. And when we think about multi-calibration and, and we discuss multi-calibration, right, Guy? Perfect. So when you think about multi-calibration with respect to many, many uh, subgroups that obviously uh, you understand that that's not feasible when you want to be fair towards hundreds of subgroups, you can't actively oversample hundreds hundreds of subgroups. And that means that we can think about better ways, or to put it more accurately, I can't think of better ways, but there are smart people like uh, Guy and Cynthia who can think about better ways. Uh, and uh, our connection to, to, to them is to try to think, to, to take their algorithms and to apply them in practice. So when we first uh, met Guy and he told us about this multi-calibration algorithm, uh, we first wanted to be convinced that it's actually a problem because as I told you, usually we think about the average performance of the model. No one really looks at the, at the performance within very specific subgroups. Yes, we do think about specific groups like uh, females and males, Caucasians and, and, and uh, African-Americans and uh, Hispanics and whatever. That's something that every paper in medicine in table one will always uh, detail, but when we think about the different um, combinations of, of subgroups, that's something that no one goes into. So in order to see whether or not it actually is a problem, uh, we took the, the that's actually the, um, the last version of the Framingham model, the most up-to-date version of that model, the cardiovascular prediction model, and we applied it to over 1 million individuals in within Clelit based on the exact same variables, the predictors that they use in the in the model. And then we chose specific protected variables that are listed on the right in this table. And we try to see whether or not the model has good calibration with respect to these uh, specific subgroups. If, is it okay that we take an extra five minutes and then uh, we, we make the, the, the other half of the lecture a bit shorter? Okay. So just so we can finish uh, at, a, at a reasonable place. So when we apply the, these equations, the pool cohort equations that, that's their name on the clearly data, on the Israeli patient data, then we saw pretty good calibration for, again, that's a model that it's not in, in, in internally developed models, usually we see perfect calibration, but for an external model that was applied to the data after some adjustment to local outcome rates, we see pretty good calibration. And when we look at the calibration in the large, we see again, an almost perfect um, number. The problem is that when we start to look at it on specific subgroups of, of patients, then what we see is actually something very different. So here you see a density plot on, uh, that takes all the hundreds of subgroups that we can define based on the protected features on our data. 
And you can see that, again, the vast majority are well calibrated, but a very large uh, proportion is uh, I received calibration of below 0.8, and uh, a large proportion, another 20% of the subgroups, uh, get a calibration of more than 1.5. So that's pretty poor calibration. If you think about what I told you before, that that calibration translates immediately to medical decisions, specifically whether or not these patients, for example, will receive uh, treatment to reduce their cholesterol level, because that's how that medical decision is actually made uh, based on a specific cut of 7.5% of risk. That means that many, many individuals will receive non-accurate predictions. If we plot that on a different uh, kind of, of plot, now uh, putting all of the subgroups on the x-axis uh, with the largest uh, subgroup, which is the entire population on the left, and specific subgroups uh, with in decreasing size on the right, then you can see that many, many, many groups are not really well calibrated. Now this is on the log scale, so now perfect calibration is, is zero. And we see that we have a problem. And uh, again, Guy, I imagine that you discussed the multi-calibration algorithm. Okay, so when we apply this multi-calibration algorithm, then we see uh, an improvement that for us was just amazing, something that we just did not expect. First, we did not expect the algorithm to converge, but it actually, for us, it was surprising that it did. And after it converged, it was um, very, very surprising how well it did. And this is all on the test set, so it's completely um, accurate. And this is the, the, the second type of plot that we, we saw. And you see that on the blue, uh, that's the post-processing uh, result of the, of the algorithm. And it's just uh, much, much, much uh, better than the initial results that we saw. And I can tell you that uh, this, this, this picture still haunts me when I apply prediction models uh, in medicine. And we're still in the process of, of integrating the multi-calibration algorithm into the, the pipeline of prediction models that we put uh, into using practice. But this was something that I never imagined would be the case uh, before we met Guy. So uh, I think it's very important to have uh, whatever domain you come from, it's very important to, to keep this picture in mind because this is the true uh, picture of a very famous medical model uh, on real life patients and that's something that we need to consider when we talk about models in any medical uh, domain and in any, any domain at all, not just medicine, uh, because uh, we don't think about these things when we develop models. We usually think about the average uh, performance and, and that's just wrong once you get accustomed to, to look at these plots. So this was pretty amazing for us. And uh, I can tell you that the variance between the calibration in the large values between these uh, subpopulations was actually reduced by more than 99%, which was pretty amazing. And, and the discrimination, the AUC values, if you ask yourself, because we asked ourselves whether if we play around with the, with, with the uh, uh, predictions using the, the multi-calibration algorithm, what will happen to the discrimination and the AUC was actually not affected at all. So again, that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, further reading could be found in this article here. And I think this is a good place to take a break before we go to talk. So just to as a, an outline, uh, we said that the first half will be based on uh, prediction models and the second part will be about causality. So we're first still in the first part, but we got to the last uh, uh, stage of the potential unfairness in the process of creating prediction models. We talked about the data, we talked about the modeling process, and now we're going to talk about the actually uh, the actual way that we use these predictions in practice. So I think we'll take a break here, uh, and uh, we'll get back in. Guy, twenty-five minutes, thirty minutes, whatever you say. Can I just ask a question? Uh, we'll get back in thirty minutes. There's a question, so hold on. Okay. Just, just a quick question on the missing data. Can you just clarify if the problem with the missing data is you don't know who is missing? Or is it the case that you do know who is missing, you just don't know how to engage with them? It, it depends on the variable. So uh, if it's a BMI variable or you know, a smoking status variable, then we know who's missing and who's not missing. If it's a diagnosis, 
and I don't see a diagnosis in the record of the patient, I don't know if that diagnosis is missing because it's actually not there. The patient does not have that condition or because it was never recorded for some reason because it was not diagnosed or because the patient did not seek healthcare services and that's why it was never documented. So it's really depending on the variable. Does that answer the question? Okay. The solutions are, that's the harder part. Thank you. Uh, there's another question in the back. Yeah. yeah. Many of my friends have expressed a lot of skepticism about giving race in medicine because they don't trust that like, it will actually be used to help them as a medicine plan. Is there a consideration that, like, especially when you use race, and then it turns out that later you discover that this is wrong, that like blows up a lot of trust in the system? Because you claim that it was there to help them, but it actually turned out that it didn't. So I'm sorry, I apologize, but someone in, in, in the front need to repeat the question because it's really hard to put. Saying that uh, their friends, uh, maybe themselves, are very skeptical of the use of race. Um, that essentially that if that when race is used in medical diagnoses, it is not going to help them. There's a lot of skepticism about this. And I guess the question is whether, and I think there was also an expression, and personally I was also thinking, talking about the example of kidney functions, it's not just a mistake, like, you know, it goes back to something Cynthia was saying about whether, you know, this is a, a, coherent, biological a, class. a coherent biological class and also a group that has suffered from, you know, systemic societal uh, discrimination. There's something very distressing about the example, right? Like, you know, it's not just a mistake that was made, it's sort of like pretty, Exacerbating a past unfairness. Yeah. So piling on. And I don't know if at the end of the day uh, there was a very concrete question, but maybe you could speak to that, to those kinds of concerns or so I, I think these concerns are are they really bother all of us. That that's the reason that these these topics uh, are being uh, discussed in again in, in the most uh, prominent medical literature today. I really encourage you to write, to read these papers, even though it's it's a medical literature. Uh, I think it's a really interesting reading. Um, the New England paper that I've cited that just goes domain by domain uh, of, of of clinical domain by clinical domain, uh, and and just presents how how the race factor got into those uh, equations in the first place and why they think in many cases it was wrong uh, and. I, I just I, I can just agree that, that it's really bothering and we need to really try to understand the sources of when and, and I think that's that's what we discussed before, whether the these variables are actually uh, when they're actually biologically connected to something and and the association, even the causal association is true because again, the, the example of, of socioeconomic status and living in places where with poor air quality and low access to healthy food, that's a true causal effect. So obviously it should affect the prediction, but only if we use the prediction, in my opinion, again, it's all my opinion, if we use this prediction for, to do something good for those individuals that will be fine at high uh, risk. But um, in other places where the, the, the fa this factor was used because it was plausible or it was thought when we had less uh, the, um, knowledge about genetics, that it represents some genetic difference, some biological difference that we could not measure back then because we didn't have the 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 uh, we, we did not have uh, full genome sequencing for whoever wants their genome to be fully sequenced. Uh, then it was actually thought that it's it's something biologically different, and and it, it was thought. I think I want to give the benefit of the doubt to those people who included these. Uh, factors uh, in the equations to begin with that they thought that they're doing something right. Uh, so I think we could just try to correct uh, these mistakes when we uh, come to, to understand that some of them were wrong. I think that it's not a, it's still not a consensus. In, I think it's some, in some of those equations, if you go into the GFR equations uh, in, in the uh, internet, in some of them, you will still see the race variable. In some of them, you will see the race variable with a notification that the, that the equation could be used with or without that variable. And, and anyone could 
just uh, apply their own judgment to whether or not they want to include it in the in the model um in the in the equation uh, and in some places it was just dropped completely dropped from the from the calculator so i think there's just not right or wrong answer i think it depends on the domain and i really encourage you to just further read into these things it's it's enlightening and it's interesting and it brings up a lot of questions There another question or am i imagining there are questions but i think we should break so maybe save your question for the second half and we'll try to leave some time for that